Good afternoon, everyone. Who of you would like to have a superpower? Let's ask this question. Any superpower. You can fly, you can see something that others don't see. Oh, OK, at least we are some. Uh, well, I want to tell you that today the world is actually full of superpowers. You come into this room, you flip a switch, and the electricity makes the lights on. You go to Google, you search for something, you get the results instant instantly. You, you can also find flights in seconds, or you can beat the world cha uh, Go champion or chess champion. I would like to today tell you maybe Python is also our own superpower. Can we solve some of our challenges as well in this world today? Like, yes, it's nice to, so, uh, to, to beat Go champion, but is there any more practical use? Can we, for example, cure diseases or at least help to cure diseases? And I would like to introduce you to Asclepius. He's a Greek god of medicine, and the Greeks got it right. The Asclepius has a, a staff, a rod, with a snake. And the snake was actually the healing power of this guy. So, hi, I'm Jan. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Uh, I've been using Python for a couple of years now. Uh, I started a company called Cardiomy, which is a company specialized in, in making tools to make cardiology or radiology for cardiologists more efficient. Oh, and there are lots of libraries and tools I use along the way. So today, I will not talk about the latest and coolest deep learning framework. I will use maybe some of them, but it's not the point of today. Today, I would like to show you a little peek, a little look into our own hearts and how we can visualize them through medical images. I want to show you also how something that used to be pretty hard before in image analysis is now becoming a bit more simpler. And then I will share with you some tips and tricks on using machine learning systems, at least that's what we have learned along the way. And I'm always happy to learn from you how you do it. So pl please, never hesitate to, to ask me and uh, contact me and suggest something better. So medical imaging is something that gives us the power to see into our bodies. There are different ways to measure and to visualize stuff in our, in our body. Many of you are probably familiar with x-ray, but there's also ultrasound used for babies or for the heart and other, one can say, modalities. And each of them measures something different in the heart. Some measure the soft tissue, some are better at visualizing the, the really hard tissue like bones. And no, so the nice thing is that we can look into our bodies without cutting them. It is pretty practical. Now, when you have the image, this is what a human would see. Well, uh, if you can see anything, it would be a picture of a, of a heart in the middle. And you, you can see it as a, as a photo of, of, of the body, a cross section around the thorax through the middle. And, uh, and there are some, this is the heart, well, the two bright parts. So when, the, when you zoom into the image, you, you, you start to see the pixels. Like the, like a normal camera picture, you, you start to see pixels. And these make the image. But how do you make something that the computer can understand? How can we make tools for radiologists that can simplify the workflows? Well, the PC sees not the pixels, but an array of numbers. So this is an array of numbers. And now the, the, the task is to get from this array of numbers to something that we can build tools on and uh, how we can make better tools for the doctors. Now, there, were, there are many ways to, to do it. Of course, you can apply tons of mathematical functions. You can uh, really dive deep into computer vision and see how you could extract what you need from the images. You, you've read lots of rules, like lots of if-elses, and you try to cover every single Gordon case. And uh, you will soon find out that it's pretty pretty difficult, so maybe there is a different way, and this way is to learn these things from the data. And this is all what machine learning is about. So instead of hard coding stuff, hard coding rules, hard coding code, you've, you start with a collection of data. You have your data, for example, images of the heart, and then you have another collection, which we can call the ground truth, which might be, for example, the doctor's annotations 
that are linked to the images. And uh, well, now you, now the magic comes. You you build your machine learning model and you do predictions. Now I would like to appreciate just for a second that how simple these things have become over the past years. Like in six lines of Python code, you you can get state of the art performance in image recognition. This is uh, using a library called Keras. It's a library that's based also on convolutional neural networks. And these, uh, these type of algorithms are really well suited to look into images, videos, sound, or any signal that is continuous in time and where the neighbors matter. So, but what does it do? I, I, I don't want to go into mathematical details here, but the intuition is pretty simple. You take your images, so in this case it's a, uh, it's a colorful image of a squirrel, uh, colorful images usually have three channels, the red, green, and blue. That's why on the top you have three images. And you are trying to find a representation of the images that captures some part of what you want to extract. So, for example, some of the images can uh, capture the fur of the squirrel. Some can capture maybe the ears or the eyes. But we can imagine that similar things would work to detect if a heart has a disease or not. And, you know, these things work beautifully well for natural images. So in those six lines of code, you get world-class performance in image recognition for natural images. You can easily learn how to, well, you're not even learning because it's, you can use the pre-trained model. You can easily do a classification of, for example, African and Indian elephants. And for those who would like to see the differences, you should look into the ear shape, the shape of the forehead, size of the ears, or size of the body. If you think about how would you code this thing manually, it's actually a pretty, pretty difficult problem. But somehow, the network, the, the convolutions the, of the operators that are combining the channels and uh, running the combinations of combinations of channels, figure out a way to, to, to do this thing re quite efficiently. So you have a pretty network, and you might want to use it to some other <coughs> task. Of course, our vision is trained uh, over our lives, but the common thing is the same. So when a doctor looks at cardiac images, th the doctors, they use exactly the same mechanism, the same, same neurons that they uh, have for looking at elephants. So why not to reuse the same, same network for something else? So you might want to extract some channels, something in the middle of the network, something that uh, captures, for example, those ears or, or eyes, and, and reuse it. So again, very simple thing. You, you can extract the models from any part of the model. And then you can plug it into a library, for example, like scikit-learn. You can uh, then really rapidly try a new stuff. You can try to, to classify uh, your own collection of cats and dogs or family pictures just by training on a couple of examples. Because now that network is trained on something bigger, you don't need to such a large data set that was used for the elephants. And the scikit-learn is also a beautiful library that, that can, that instead of the focusing on this, uh, what some call deep learning, is focused on the uh, really well-tested, battle-tested algorithms for uh, every single machine learning domain almost. Uh, so, for example, here we would use a linear SV, SVM, which is, called, which is a classifier. A classifier that takes the features, takes the channels, and outputs a decision. But this also works for heart. So if you would like to see more, uh, just uh, check out, for example, my thesis. And uh, there's, a, uh, there's a way to, to train these things for hearts by reusing the same network from before. And it works quite nice because it, nicely because you don't need so many examples to, to train the network. Here, you might be OK with 200 images, and you get a pr very good performance. But of course, you might want to train the network from scratch. So what do you then need to learn is uh, the set of blocks, the set of blocks that are used, and what is their function. So you will come across uh, something like convolutions, max poolings, flattening layers, dense layers. In the end, 
it's just a nice Lego, uh, Lego. You can play with Legos, you can put the bricks together, and they fit actually quite nicely. Once you get the intuition, you, there's no such a need for the deep mathematics behind, although it's highly recommended to get better intuition even. But you can get really far with, uh, with playing with the, these existing blocks. And, uh, well, you define your model, you then define some loss function. Loss function is tell you, telling you how, how well the model is fitting to your data. So a high loss means that your model is bad. A low loss means that your model nicely can capture what, what you want it to capture in the data, the, the patterns. And then you just fit the model so you, you have your images, your labels, and you can save the model for later reuse. So we use something at Cardiomy similar to this. We, we define our own model and uh, train it on, on cardiac images. So what used to take, for example, our ra radiologist 30 minutes, they, they can now do in 12 seconds. And that's, that's quite a dramatic difference. So now instead of the, the radiologist talking to you for, for two minutes and looking at the images for 28, the, the whole thing can flip. And uh, you can have your doctor talking to you to actually 28 minutes and looking at the images for two only. And uh, of course, the, it was also quite remarkable to, to notice that this network has learned what the cardiologist uh, and radiologists need to study for years in uh, medical schools. Of course, we're not here to replace them. We want to uh, aid them in making their processes more efficient and to help us more. Once you have your model trained, we might want to, to build a web service around that. And uh, one of the good things in Python, it's, that's why it's really, to me, a, a massive superpower. You can, you can use it for all, all parts of the stack. So you train your model, you process your data in Python, and then you can build a web server that serves this model to the world. So why not to do it, for example, with Flask? But you also want to somehow package the model so that you can run it on any machine. And that's uh, something pretty important to, to be sure that all the dependencies and all, all the packages that your model requires are bundled together with the model. And that's, that's where Docker might help you. It's not written in Python, but it's, it's a nice way to expose any, any of your applications, not only web, web applications like here. So this is the Flask model, which can be very simple. We just define one route and uh, on, take the input, process the request input into some image, predict with the model that you have loaded previously, uh, and then convert back the prediction to something you want to use and consume. Just don't run this into, in production, please. Uh, well, and uh, when you want to pack it with Docker, then it's actually very simple too. All you need to do is just copy this, the, the source code and uh, the requirements, do pip install in the Docker container and uh, expose some, some port and you're, you're done. Now your application runs on mostly any Linux machine or even on the cloud. So, but for that, you need to first build a container, which is just a Docker build command, run it and your service is ready. It's really that simple, three steps. Well, this was something that we, uh, we were doing at Cardiomy for the past months. And now I would like to share with you some tips that, uh, that improve our, our machine learning strategy. At least I, I, I feel that this is uh, something that is helping us in, in the whole goal. Because machine learning is a bit different from standard software engineering. Software engineering, you, you write simple unit tests, and uh, if they pass, you're, you're done. But now you have also to take care of data, you have to take care of other dependencies, and you want to also improve your models. So the first thing is really to iterate fast. You don't, you, just there's no point in, in making the latest and greatest model at first. Just something that uh, is good enough is probably a good start. The, Convolutional neural networks are also pretty good, but if something that is not even machine learning helps you solve, solve the problem, there's a pretty good baseline. And the baseline is something that's really important to compare against. But how do you want to compare? 
Well, first you want to see which model is better than the other, and uh, so that you can then think around with your model, poke it, and see how it behaves, just like a living organism, and really just try something, see how it responds, and play with that. So it's good to define one metric, and that's dependent on the application. Uh, you can visualize the the metrics also in TensorBoard, which is uh, again an open source package coming from TensorFlow. Um, and then you select the right, the best model. Also, the debugging of machine learning to me is a bit more challenging. You just cannot see everything that's happening in the training. Well, part of that you can, but not everything. So it's good to visualize everything you can. So some intermediate results, some intermediate parts of the of the models, and and see where it fails. And where it fails is where you should drill in and uh, uh, try to fix and find ideas what should be better. Only oh, visualize everything. Of course, that's something also even more important is to be able to progress with confidence, which which means. Once you build your model, and then you somehow forgot uh, or forget how, how you got to the model, that's not really that useful. And uh, that's something that's even more important in machine learning, it's to, just to be able to reproduce the whole pipeline, to be able to recover from any mistake, and to just give you a confidence to try out stuff and try it fast. And uh, one of the things that seemed to work pretty well for us is to build your, uh, put your code, your data, or even your infrastructure and your pipelines into the, into the build pipeline, and uh, let the continuous integration server run and launch the builds. And when they're done, your machine learning, learning models are just artifacts of your build. Now, data. Data is probably the single most important enabler in any data science, machine learning. It, dirty data is not going to get you far. And uh, also playing with different formats of data is not useful. So instead of wasting time converting stuff to the same format, why not to just uh, store everything in one single location to have one single pattern of access and uh, one single format? So for all the metadata, Postgres is pretty amazing. But uh, what about the other data? The blobs? Well, I don't have the magic solution for that, but uh, just on the talk before, there was mentioned MiniODB, which is, seems like a nice replacement for, for S3 of Amazon. So why not use that combined with Postgres? If you have a smaller data set, which is often the case in medical imaging, Often, we don't have many people with some unique diseases. So we might to find uh, we have to find different ways to, to augment, to enlarge the data set, to, to learn. But of course, it would not be really ethical to make people sick just to get another data point. So uh, why not to do something else? Like there are probably ways to generate synthetic images if you know the model behind how the images are generated. You can do that. You can also try to what's called augment the data, which, for example, if you have an image of a cat, and if you rotate the, the image of the cat, it's still a cat. You have to be careful for medical imaging, because if you scale the image, you might change the diagnosis. But there are ways to go around that. There are also ways to generate images that look like uh, the real ones, just add more artifacts, for example. If you have data, just you don't have them labeled, the, probably the most important thing is to, to give them labels, if you, if you really can. And I could not recommend more the scikit-learn label propagation class that, that can help you to, to take your unlabeled data and suggest you which, which data, which images you might want to annotate next. So, finally, be practical. Again, don't go for the latest, coolest uh, network, uh, and the latest, coolest uh, deep learning library. Actually, if you choose Keras, MXNet, TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, Torch, it does not really matter that much. They are all, all pretty powerful and all reasonably equivalent. So also don't get stuck in your idea. Something I suffer a lot from, that I, if I did not invent something, and there is some other 
some other paper maybe that's doing something better. I, I still have to fight a lot to be to change it and to, to to remove my idea. So just don't 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 get stuck with your own stuff if there's anything better out there. Okay. So our overall experience with Python has been fantastic. I could not be more thankful for the community that's uh, that's around Python. I think that's there is no other place which is uh, so welcoming, so helpful. Uh, the, this is Python seems like it is becoming this really the language uh, of of data scientists. So it there are lots of tools that are built around the ecosystem that help us to build stuff really fast. Also to fail fast, but it's also very important to try. Also some takeaways. I. I've been building something that I, I really like and care about. I, I, I really want to see less and less of cardiac diseases in this world. Today, it is 45% uh, deaths are re related to cardiovascular disease. And I just think that's too much. So I really hope that something of this will help to solve, solve this problem. Just don't forget if you do any any learning, any 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 software development, just poke around with uh, the stuff you're using and have fun, because I really believe that Python is a superpower we all have. And just please, let's all go and build something nice. Thank you. <laughs>